Her new novel, The Wonder, a thrilling domestic psychodrama about a fasting girl in 1850s Ireland, has already been shortlisted for Canada's Giller Prize. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Emma Donahue. 1859, we are in the Midlands of Ireland in an unspecified village in the Boglands. I unspecified the village because I didn't think any real village would like me to pin this story to their history. And because this is, in fact, a fictional story, but um, it's inspired by about 50 real cases of so-called fasting girls. Every now and then, between the 16th century and the 20th century, someone, usually a young woman or a teenage girl, would become a, a celebrity for an apparent or claimed ability to live without food. So um, I've been interested in these cases for 20 years, and no one of them was just right for me to write about. I usually, if I have a trademark at all, it's in taking a real case or a tiny little fact and spinning a fiction around it. But in the case of the Fasting Girls, there was no one case that was just right for me, so eventually I made up my own. So we're in 1859, and a nurse, an English nurse called Lib Wright, has been uh, summoned over from England from her hospital in London to do a two-week nursing job. And on arrival, she is horrified to learn that this is not some medically complex case of a wound or an illness, but it's a case of a girl who is said not to eat and, um, and not to have eaten for four months. And really, Libright has been hired to watch her, so kind of a surveillance or prison guard situation. Um, and in the, uh, I'm going to read you, you a little bit from the start of the second day. In her dream, the men were calling for tobacco, as always. Underfed, unwashed, hair crawling, ruined limbs seeping through slings into stump pillows, but all the men's pleas were for something to fill their pipes. They reached out to Lib as she swept down the ward in her dream. Through the cracked windows drifted the Crimean snow, and a door kept banging, banging. Mrs. Wright! Here, Lib croaked, confused as she woke. A quarter past four, you asked to be waked. So this was the room above the spirit grocery in the dead centre of Ireland. So the voice in the crack of the door was the servant's, Maggie Ryan's. Lib cleared her throat. Y yes, she said, yes. Once she dressed, she took out notes on nursing and let it fall open, and then put her finger on a random passage, like that storytelling, fortune-telling game Lib and her sister used to play with the Bible on dull Sundays. Women, she read, were often more exact and careful than the stronger sex, which enabled them, according to Miss Nightingale, to avoid mistakes of inadvertence. Lib shut the book. For all the care she had taken yesterday at the O'Donnell's cabin, she hadn't managed to uncover the mechanism of the fraud yet, had she? Sister Michael had been there all night. Would she have solved the puzzle in Lib's absence? Lib doubted it somehow. The nun had probably sat there with eyes half-closed during her whole shift, clacking her rosary beads. Well, Lib refused to be gulled by a child of eleven like Anne O'Donnell. Today, she would have to be even more exact and careful, proving herself worthy of the inscription on this book. She reread it now, Miss Nightingale's beautiful script, to Mrs. Wright, who has the true nurse calling. How the lady had frightened Lib, and not only at first meeting, Every word Miss Nightingale pronounced rang as if from a mighty pulpit. No excuses, she told her raw recruits. Work hard and refuse God nothing. Do your duty while the world whirls, and do not complain, do not despair. Better to drown in the surf than stand idly on the shore. In a private interview with Mrs. Wright, she'd made a most peculiar remark. You have one great advantage over most of your fellow nurses, Mrs. Wright. You're bereft free of ties. Lib remembered looking down at her hands in the interview, untied, empty. So tell me, Miss Nightingale had asked, are you ready for this good fight? Can you throw your whole self into the breach? Yes, Lib had said, yes, I can. Dark still now in the middle of Ireland, only a three-quarter moon to light Lib along the village's single street, and then a right turn down the lane, past the tilting greenish headstones. Just as well she hadn't a superstitious bone in her body. 
Without moonlight, she would never have picked the correct faint path leading off to the O'Donnell's farm, because all these cabins looked like much of a muchness. A quarter to five on her watch when she tapped at the door. No answer. Lib hardly liked to bang harder in case of disturbing the family. Brightness leaked from the door of the byre off to her right. Ah, the women had to be milking. A trail of melody was one of them singing to the cows. It was not a hymn this time for once, but the kind of plaintive ballad that Leib had never liked. But heaven's own light shone in her eyes, she was too good for me, and an angel claimed her for his own and took her from Loch Ree. Lib pushed the front door of the cabin and the upper half gave way. Firelight blazed in the empty kitchen of the O'Donnells. Something stirring in the corner, a rat? Her year in the foul wards of the Crimean had hardened Lib to vermin. She fumbled for the latch to open the lower half of the door. She crossed and bent to look through the barred base of the dresser. The beady eye of a chicken, <coughs> the beady eye of a chicken met hers. A dozen or so birds in behind the first started up with their soft complaint. Shut in there to save them from the foxes outside, Lib supposed. She spotted a new laid egg. And something occurred to her. Perhaps little Anna O'Donnell sucked them in the night and ate the shells, leaving no trace. Stepping back, Lib almost tripped on something white, a saucer, rim poking out from beneath the dresser. How could the maid have been so careless as to leave it there? When Lib picked it up, liquid sloshed in her hand, soaking her cuff. She hissed and she carried the saucer over to the table, and only then did it register with her. She put her tongue to her wet hand, the tang of milk, so, the grand fraud was that simple? No need for the child to hunt for eggs even when there was a dish of milk left out for her to lap at like a dog in the dark. Lip felt more disappointment than triumph. Exposing this hoax hardly required a trained nurse. It seemed this job was done already and she would be in the jaunting car on her way back to the railway station by the time the sun came up. The door scraped open behind her and Lib jerked around as if it were she who had something to hide. Mrs. O'Donnell, she said. The Irish woman, Anna's mother, mistook accusation for greeting. Good morning to you, Mrs. Wright, she said, and I hope you got a wink of sleep. Kitty, the maid, behind her, narrow shoulders dragged down by two buckets. Lib held up the saucer, which was chipped in two places, she noticed now. Someone in this household has been secreting milk under the dresser, she said. Rosaline O'Donnell's chapped lips parted in the beginnings of a silent laugh. I can only presume that your daughter has been sneaking out to drink it, said Lib. She then you presume too much, said Rosalind O'Donnell. In what farmhouse in the land does there not be a saucer of milk left out at night? The maid said, for the little ones, half smiling as if marvelling at the Englishwoman's ignorance. Otherwise wouldn't they take offence and cause eruption? You expect me to believe that this milk is for the fairies, asked Lib. Rosaline O'Donnell folded her big boned arms. Believe what you like or believe nothing, ma'am, but putting out the drop of milk does no harm, at least. Lib's mind raced. Both maid and mistress just might be credulous and superstitious enough for this to be the reason why the milk was under the dresser, but that did not mean Anne O'Donnell hadn't been sipping from the fairy's dish every night for four months. Kitty bent to open the dresser. Get out with ye now. Isn't the grass full of slugs? She hustled the chickens towards the door with her skirts. The bedroom door opened, and the other nurse, the nun, looked out. In her usual whisper, is anything the matter? Not at all, said Lib, unwilling to explain her suspicions. How was the night? Peaceful, thank God. Presumably meaning peaceful in that Sister Michael hadn't caught the child eating yet. But how hard had she really tried, Lib wondered, given her trust in God's mysterious ways. Was the nun going to be any help to Lib at all, or only a hindrance? Mrs. O'Donnell swung the iron crock off the fire now. Broom in hand, Kitty the maid flicked the hen's greenish dirt out of the dresser. The nun had disappeared into the bedroom again, leaving the door ajar. Lib was just untying her cloak when Malachi O'Donnell, the father, stepped in from the farmyard with an armful of turf. Mrs. Wright, he said. Mr. O'Donnell. He dumped the sods by the fire and then turned to go out again, and she remembered to ask him, might there be a platform scales hereabouts on which I could weigh your daughter? Uh, I'm afraid there would not, he said. Then how do you weigh your livestock, she asked. He scratched his purplish nose. 
By I, I suppose. A child-sized voice in the room within. It was Anna. Is it herself up already? Asked the father, his face lighting. Mrs. O'Donnell cut past him and went into their daughter, just as Sister Michael stepped out with her satchel. And Lib followed the mother. She moved to follow the mother, but the father held up his hand and he said, You, you had another question now? Uh, did I? She should really have been by the child's side already to prevent a moment's gap between one nurse's shift and the next. But she found it impossible, contrary to the rules of manners, to walk away in the middle of a conversation. About the walls, he said. Kitty said you were after asking about the walls. Uh, the walls, yes, said Lib. There do be some dung in there now with the mud and heather and a bit of hair for grip, said Malachy O'Donnell. Hair? Really? Lib's eyes slid towards the bedroom. Could this apparently ingenuous fellow be a decoy? Might his wife have scooped something out of the cooking pot in her hands before she rushed in to greet her daughter? And there's a bit of blood in there, too, in the walls, he said, and a drop of buttermilk. And Lib stared at him. Blood and buttermilk and hair and dung and heather as if poured out on some primitive altar. I'll leave that there. Thank you. It's been a, an enormous pleasure going back to Ireland with this book, uh, I mean in the writing of this book, because um, although I left at 20, you know, your first 20 years are the ones that count, so I'll always be Irish more than I am Canadian, even though I've now spent 18 years in Canada. Um, and this is the first time in quite a while that I've set a full-length novel in Ireland, and it's the first historical novel I've set there, so I so enjoyed going back there with this story. I mean, really, this particular story of a little girl sort of caught up in the fundamentalist rules of her society, it could have been set anywhere. Just last week, I heard about a case in India, India where a 13-year-old girl died after a 68-day total fast. So this particular kind of pattern of um, uh, zealotry, you could find anywhere. But I decided it was most honest, if you are criticizing a culture, to go back to your own culture and do it there, you know? <laughs> They still might feel the sting, but at least you have some right to an opinion, you know? Um, I also so enjoyed, in a way, uh, looking at the roots of the culture I grew up in, meaning that I grew up in Ireland in the 1970s and 80s, so it was very different from this. You know, we were not leaving out milk for the fairies. Um, but there, were still, there was still a flavor left behind of that kind of 19th century Irish Catholicism. If you had a, a cut or a wart or something, somebody might say to you, offer it up, you know, as if it was like a little present to Jesus, as if he'd be happy about the wart or the cut. Um, and, and we gave up, I remember we, we gave up sweets for Lent, all of us, in a way which completely focused our minds on nothing but sugar for the entire period of Lent. Um, in that there was a convention that if you were offered sweets or chocolate during Lent, you could say, no, but can I take it home for Easter? So you'd take home the you know, individually wrapped square of Cadbury's wrapped up in a, in a Kleenex maybe, and, and I'd, I'd keep them you know, behind my holy pictures or, or inside a little statue, and every night I'd examine my hoard. So really, you couldn't have designed a better way to focus my mind on the thing that I was meant to be rising above. <laughs> in that case, the longing for sugar. Um, You know, I really like, I like best to, uh, to speak in, in answer to questions, so I'm going to open it up to questions now. And I don't say if you have questions, because every audience has questions. And don't worry, don't panic at this point, because if you don't have questions, I can supply Hello. my own. I was very disappointed that uh, Room did not win the Booker, because I really like that book. Oh. And you don't have to answer this, but I wanted your opinion about how you felt about the film if you saw it. Uh, given that I wrote it um, and I got nominated for an Oscar for it, it was a very happy experience. So yes, I, I saw it and more. Excuse me. Um, my mic clearly picked up the surge of egotism there. <laughs> it's actually an ego detector microphone. <laughs> yes, um, the, I, 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 I so enjoyed the film because I thought um, it, it, I thought Lenny Abramson, my fellow Dubliner who made the film, um, he didn't always make the same decisions as I would have, but he always had taste. I knew he would never make it a, a creepy, rapey kind of film, which would be an obvious danger, given that um, when you treat a subject like um, imprisonment and rape in, uh, on screen, there's far more of a danger of visual voyeurism than on the page through a child's eye. So he didn't make it that kind of film, and I also knew I could trust him not to make it a really sort of sentimental film either. Um, so I thought he, he picked his way beautifully between those dangers. 
And um, yeah, I really enjoyed it. It's, it's a kind of a test case for me in what fiction can do well and what film can do well. Um, I think film can make people cry. I've seen a lot of grown men stumble out of the cinema crying after seeing the film of Room, which it's, it sounds a bit mean to say how much I enjoy that, seeing, <laughs> seeing grown men cry. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I think film is very good at that. Film is very good at giving visual information very quickly. So in the book, I take about the first 30 pages to let Jack drop lots of little hints that maybe this world he lives in is actually a strangely small one. Um, and in the film, the camera turns around once and you see where you are and the plot moves on quickly. So they do different things. Uh, th fiction has room in it for so many thoughts, so many little episodes. You know, there's a moment in the book where Jack meets his grandmother's book club. It only takes about three pages, but I get to do a lot of enjoyable sort of social satire there. And it would be just incongruous in the film to suddenly have, you know, seven actors troop on for a scene about a book club. So, so film, and, film and fiction are very different, but I really enjoyed the opportunity to, to tell the whole story again in a different form. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, if everybody was, uh, was sensitive enough to cry in the book, that would be great. But for many people, it's just, it's especially when you add the soundtrack of a film that just And I think one thing I love about um, books is that every reader brings their own ideas to a book. Some people have read a book like Room and... Uh, been shattered by it. They say to me, it's just devastating, tragic. I was left, you know, shadowed for weeks. And other people say to me, oh, I read that book with that cute boy. <laughs> so <laughs> people bring their own emotional tone to it. They, in a way, a book doesn't really happen until the reader reads it. Um, it's a meeting of minds. This is why I don't care whether my books sell as e-books or as audiobooks or whether they're adapted into different forms because really I would be just as happy injecting my story straight into your brains and I'm sure within five to ten years I'm sure we'll have a method for that. I, I am very fascinated with the, with the cultural aspect of the things that you're talking about. When I first came to Philadelphia, my first day here, I met a, an Irish guy, and um, I was rowing with an Irish guy, as a matter of fact, uh, and he came over and he said that he bet on us because he saw us as you know, one Irish guy and one black guy rowing as being, as being similar in, in experience. And I was wondering, when you mentioned, you talked a little bit about the fact that you could criticize your own culture, do you see these uh, um, cultural analogs when you write between very different people of the world, like Indian people and African people and Irish people? Yeah, um, even though this novel was set in 19th century Ireland, as I always do, I throw my research net very wide. So I read a lot, for instance, about the traditions of fasting in India. India and Ireland both have the strong tradition of fasting as a form of political protest, you know. Um, a woman just finished a 16-year hunger strike against the government in India. So, and I, when I was growing up, Northern Irish prisoners were hunger striking in order to get a better political prisoner status in, in Northern Irish jails. So I looked at that, I, I read a lot about um, Ethiopia and, and the legacy of famine there. Famine has some very interesting long-term effects on the psyche of a whole nation. So, so when I'm trying to get one time and place right, I, I read about lots of other times and places, anything that can help me imagine what it might have been like, the kind of stuff that doesn't show up in the history books, you know, that the moment by moment thinking of people. And um, similarly, when I was researching Room, you know, there are no examples of a child who has grown up like Jack in a locked room but with ideal circumstances and nobody scaring him or hitting him. So uh, I read all sorts of things about, for instance, refugees from Haiti coming to Canada and how the children adapt so quickly and the parents are left shell-shocked. I read about um, orphans uh, adopted from Romanian orphanages into San Francisco and the culture clash, the, the major cultural shift they have to go through. So, so yeah, it's a funny thing. You want to be... You want to be authentic and specific about what you're writing about, but to make a good novel, you actually have to think much more broadly than that. And you have to say to yourself, I want this story to mean something to readers all over the world, and so I have to find the universal in it, but without making it kind of blandly generic. So there's that constant tension between, you know, the tiny details of the, the hens in the dresser and the saucer left out for the milk, but then you also think about 
you know, I was always, always thinking of modern analogies too for this story. When I was trying to characterize Anna O'Donnell, I was thinking about teenagers who get radicalized and go off to the Middle East, um, teenagers who join cults, the many ways in which uh, youthful idealism can be harnessed by bad causes. So yeah, you're constantly going back and forth between the particular and the universal. Um, I was, so I heard today that um, Bob Dylan was the winner of the Nobel Prize in Literature. Um, <laughs> What are your thoughts on that as an author um, versus... I was afraid somebody was going to ask me that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, versus musician or poet or even... I feel a, a bit the same way I do about the Man Booker Prize being now open to Americans. <laughs> A, a, certain, a certain fear that territory is being lost and that if we let, you know, the brilliance of songwriters now count as literature, none of us are safe. We'll never, re we'll never win a prize again. Um, no, more seriously, he's, he's such a phenomenon. I couldn't grudge him anything, um, but I think it's an alarming precedent. So if I had been giving out the prize, I'd have said this does not set any precedent in law. <laughs> Bob, you can have it, but nobody else. It seems that the character you're describing in this book I would characterize as a teenage hysteric, and there seems to be a long line of them in Roman Catholicism. I was thinking of St. Catherine of Siena. Would you comment on that? Sure, uh, yes. Um, when I was researching the fasting girls, in a way I looked at lots of analogous groups. So um, medieval saints seem to have, you know, starved themselves, uh, or at least that's certainly part of the stories told about them. St. Catherine of Siena is described as eating as little as possible, and when she was obliged to eat a little bit, she would poke her throat with a little twig and stick it back up again. So, you know, you, you can look at a story like that and say, how is that different from bulimia nowadays? Um, but you can't forget the differences either. So I certainly looked at l that long tradition of, of fasting within the church. And I also looked at modern studies of eating disorders in a totally secular context. I also looked at things like, and um, there was a 1940s um, scientific study in America of starvation populated by healthy male volunteers. And the idea was to work out how to refeed people once they were rescued from the camps in Europe. Um, so, so all these young men volunteered to eat very little for months and then, and then to, be, to be tested as they were refed. So I, I really read in all directions, but I think, um, I think it made a lot of sense for me to place this fictional story in the Catholic tradition, given that there is this kind of worship of ab abstemiousness. You know, there's a strain of Catholicism which is very anti-body, anti-flesh, anti-sex, anti-appetite. Um, for instance, one of, the, one of the cult texts, The Imitation of Christ, I was, I was quite shaken when I read that book. It seemed in such a hurry to shed the flesh and move on to being pure spirit. And I think one of the wonderful things about human beings is that we are both. We're an unlikely yoking of flesh and spirit. And I wouldn't want to see us without spirit, and I wouldn't want to see us without flesh either. Thank you. Um, with apologies to anyone who hasn't read this book, I know, no spoilers now. Oh. Watch yourself. No, no, seriously, you can come and talk to me afterwards if there's a plot twist you want to discuss. Don't wreck it. This has been podcasted. <laughs> Think of the cultural power. You know, the ripples will grow tonight. Bob Dylan's Nobel win will be completely overshadowed, you know. We're pivoting the news story here. What? Is there something you can ask without a spoiler? Oh, I'm sure there's many things I could ask without a spoiler. Would you like one of those instead? Yes, and yes, I'll, and seriously, and come up to me afterwards, afterwards and ask your other question. Okay, well, how about um, the pool with the tree, with the thing, is that, is that based on fact? And this is totally not what I was gonna ask. But. No, still, it's a, it's a good question. <laughs> yeah, and actually the British cover of the book, the American cover features this beautiful spoon, which, which I love because when I look at it for a while, it starts to look like a little girl to me. It's very humanoid. Um, but the British and Canadian cover features uh, the, the holy tree near a well. Um, Irish Catholicism is interestingly place specific. In fact, there's a theory that basically uh, Christianity managed to replace paganism in Ireland by just renaming things. It was a rebranding campaign. <laughs> they'd come to your local village and they'd find you, you know, worshiping the spirit of the stream and they'd say, grand, that's St. Bridget's stream. She 
washed the Virgin Mary's laundry here as they fled from Egypt. I mean, seriously, there are, non there are stories like that where St. Bridget plays this very domestic role as midwife to Jesus and general helper. And so they'd say, we'll call that Bridget's stream now. And in fact, St. Bridget may herself be a rebranding of, of a Celtic goddess. And so, yeah, one of, one of the phenomena you get is um, a water source and a tree near it, and the two would be thought to have healing powers, and they were used in various ways. Um, I was recently in the west of Ireland, and I found one of these holy trees, and people were basically writing their wishes or their hopes for the world and hanging it on the tree. You know, little baggage tags, for instance, airplane baggage tags. You know, peace on earth, they would say. I was really moved by it. Um, so, uh, so that tradition does exist, and the, ver the version I use in this book is the idea that you would take a rag and you would rub it on the bit of your body that hurt, you know, literally on the, the wound or the sore or the, the broken bit, and then you would tie the rag on the tree, and the belief was that by the time the rag rotted away, your pain would be gone. And what's really crafty about that particular superstition is that it takes a long time for a rag to rot away. <laughs> so it's a bit like saying, come back in 10 years and I predict your frozen shoulder will be cured, ma'am. But, you know, I, I mean, I, I'm scoffing and yet I'm very moved by it too. You know, that image of, of, of the rags dangling there taking so long to rot away. Um, and that would be an example in this book of one of the many things that my protagonist doesn't understand because I knew that I wanted it to be the story of a nurse watching a child because in a few of these fasting girls' cases there were, there were official watches set up and I thought it was a wonderful paradox that those who were there to just neutrally observe the situation um, clearly in some cases ended up making it worse. Um, the first fasting girl case I ever heard about was one in Wales, Sarah Jacob, and they set a watch on her and she died. So clearly the watch did something to disrupt however she had been managing to sneak food. So um, I thought it a, a really painful paradox that you know, the, the observer effect would make sure that um, you know, the thing you're looking at neutrally, you actually find yourself complicit in, in the, the, the dreadful harm that's coming to this girl. So I knew I needed a nurse, and I wanted her to be a very capable one, and I knew that my 21st century readers would probably click with her more easily than with all these crazy Irish peasants. But I didn't want her to be perfect, so I thought of her in some ways as like, you know, somebody from America sent by an NGO to sub-Saharan Africa. You know, they've got all the book smarts, but I bet they still make a lot of mistakes on the ground just from lack of cultural familiarity, lack of cultural education. So I saw this nurse the same way, that yes, she can, you know, she knows quite a lot about nursing, um, she's very educated, but in Ireland she's misreading everything, she doesn't know what the tree is with the rags dangling from it. Uh, she persistently misreads things and she has a wealth of anti-Irish and anti-Catholic prejudice on her shoulders. So she makes mistakes too. Um, and I, I, above all, I wanted her to have to change over the course of the book too, because to me, an, a character shouldn't really be in a novel unless they're going to change. It's only interesting when everything in the novel affects everything else. I wanted to ask about a different book. Um, did you have the idea for frog music and then found the story, or did the story find you and then you wrote about it? The story found me first. Um, I, I don't know why I am generally so reliant on these little true stories. You know, sometimes I think it's a pathetic crutch. Other writers just make it up, you know, and they do wonderfully. So why do I need to somehow sign up as kind of historian and detective and fiction writer? Because sometimes the impulses are, are positively contradictory. You know, I remember spending an entire day in the Bodleian Library in Oxford, which is very hard to get into. You have to get a member of an Oxford college to write you out a long sort of recommendation. And I got in trouble because I'd written in the description of my research topic in my handwriting, not his. So anyway, I get in there and my job was to read um, a memoir of this particular Victorian admiral by his sister. And I, I was writing a novel about his divorce case, so I was thinking I'd find wonderful, meaty stuff in this memoir. Very obscure book. I could only find a copy in the Bodleian Library. And above all, I wanted to know um, what uh, a mysterious sealed letter was that his lawyers had brandished in court during the divorce. His lawyers had held up a package and said that it contained a sort of memo he, writ he wrote himself about why he asked his wife's friend to leave the house. You know? So they waved this around in court, but they never opened it because a lawyer friend of mine says, you never ask for something to be opened unless you already know what's in it. You know? So anyway, there I am. I finally get to the Bodleian Library. Um, and I spent an entire day reading this memoir by his sister, and it proves to be utterly bland and boring. She left out his entire first marriage. She didn't give any juicy details. So at the end of the day, 
as a researcher and a, as a historian, I was deeply frustrated. And then as I walked away from the library, I thought, great, I can make it up. Um, so it's, it's perverse. You want to know as many facts as possible, but you want there to be huge spaces that you can populate and fill with your imagination. So I don't quite know why, you know, I, I need the mast before I hang the sail on it. You know, there's just, maybe it's because I, I, I did a degree and then a PhD, maybe that just got me hooked on a little bit of, a little bit of history, a little bit of the real, but I just find it hugely stimulating to my imagination. And sometimes it's only a tiny little bit of fact. Um, my first historical novel, Slammerkin, was inspired by, you know, just a one paragraph entry in an encyclopedia of Welsh women's history. Um, so, uh, you know, anytime, in fact, I've worked on sources that are very plentiful, um, I found it quite difficult because you're wading through so much material. So there's just something about the little bit of fact. It's like, it's like salt on the meat, you know? Um, I would say from the age of seven, I've been writing poems, and I won't say they were always good, but I always enjoyed them. So it was, it was my intense pleasure in the writing that made me think that I should always do this. However, I didn't think I'd be able to live off it. In fact, my model of how writing worked was that you died young and your works were discovered under your bed, you know? <laughs> this was some bizarre combination of Emily Dickinson and Anne Frank, you know? I just thought of writing as posthumous, you know? Um, and, and so I still can't quite believe that I have ended up, you know, writing for the last, well, really, I'm almost 47. I've been writing for 40 years and nobody stopped me and I have never had to get a real job. You know, that's the thrill of it. Um, I, the moment when I felt like a real writer in the grown-up sense was, I suppose, more basically when I got my first contract for a novel. Um, because uh, it was a contract for two novels. And my, this is an example of how agents are actually wonderful. You might think that they're just you know, sinister, lawyer-like figures who take a cut, but actually they're, they're crucial mentors and helpers. Um, I wrote my first novel and my, I got an agent and she, she showed it to everyone in London, it seemed, and nobody would touch it. They all said, talented but not talented enough. Um, and she said to me, go ahead and write the second, and we'll sell them together. <laughs> I said, hang on, if they don't want one, why would they want two? <laughs> and she said, well, two novels prove that you have legs as a writer, you've got a future. You know, because she suggested that it's a bit like a, a startup in Silicon Valley. You know, it costs them a lot to, to get you published in the first place and get some attention for you, but the idea was that then there should be uh, economies of scale as the novels roll out. So I thought this was a mad plan, but I really wanted to write the book. So I went ahead and wrote the second one, and she did sell the two novels together to Penguin. So suddenly I was looking at a contract and um, I thought, perhaps I could live on this if I kept my expenses low, you know, perhaps I could get away without having to be an adult and get a sensible job, you know? Um, as you researched and wrote about the debunking of the miraculous, did you ever find yourself rooting for the possibility of the miraculous? That's a good question. Um, you could say I did write this novel from the skeptic's point of view in that I wasn't wanting to write a story that ends with some kind of twist towards the miraculous. In a way, what I like to do is to find the miraculous within the ordinary human range of emotions. To me, I thought it was miraculous if a hostile stranger like the nurse could find herself within about a week caring about this child so much that she's willing to break a lot of rules and go against everything she's been taught by her own mentor, Florence Nightingale, in order to save this child. So that kind of thing to me is a miracle. Or in Room, you know, I didn't want some angel springing the doors open. To me it was miraculous that the kind of ordinary heroism of a young mother might be enough to make this kind of bubble of safety and happiness around a child. So that's the kind of miracle I'm interested in. But I would say what I, what I did take seriously at every point in The Wonder is um, the power of faith, how much it holds people up. So I wasn't focused on is it true or not. I was interested in looking at its actual effects on people. And I can quite see why the Irish Catholic peasants clung to Catholicism because it was a worldview that gave their lives meaning. It made them feel that they were as important as the rich and powerful of Europe um, and that you know the last would be first and the first would be last and the meek would inherit the earth. Um, it's, it's a great faith for poor people in particular. And I could see why a child who had no good prospects of, she'd never have a job or a vote, but 
you know, Catholicism managed to make her feel that she was as good a soul as anyone and possibly better. So I, I took that very seriously and I tried, in particular in portraying Anne O'Donnell, I was never making fun of her. I was trying to look at the ways in which she's a very a bright child, an idealistic one, even at times quite a humble one, but she's got caught up in this belief which only leads one way. You know, if she follows her logic, she has to, you know, as she sees it, she has to die because that's, that's where the path leads. So I'm, I'm appalled in the writing of the book that a child would, would get locked into a, a faith like that by, by the group think around her. But yet I wanted to appreciate at every point how exalted that child is feeling by the, by the system she's living within, you know? So it was a, it was a fine balance, you know? I'm liking these questions, by the way. I, I would, have, would have said till now that any time I've had a Boston audience, the questions have been way up there. But now I'm thinking Philadelphia and Boston. <laughs> Sorry to generalize, but you know I have to deal with a lot of stupid questions over the course of a book tour. Hi. Um, so you have room that's in a child's perspective, a five-year-old child, and then you wrote The Wonder that has an adult perspective. Um, I just want to know what preference you'd rather write in because it's because I'm actually writing a novel for my senior project and the ch I'm writing in a child perspective. And you know, you kind of want to protect that child, but in a way, you know, you can't protect their characters. And also, like the audience and the, the author knows more um, than what the child knows in the story. So I just want to know what you prefer, what were the challenges of writing in those two different point of views? What a lovely technical question. I love it. Um, and how cool is that that you're writing a novel for your senior project? Um, you know, when I, when I was growing up, I studied English literature, but any writing I did on the side was completely extra. Nobody was, you know, rewarding for me for it. It was seen as just something private you did in your spare time, you know? Anyway, to answer your question, for me, it's all about what secrets you want to keep because it's very powerful to have something be from a character's perspective, but then you have to pretty much accept that unless your protagonist, unless your point of view character is going to play quite a lot of tricks, I'm thinking, say, in um, Agatha Christie's The Merger of Roger Ackroyd, he's a very unreliable narrator. So unless you've got some system like that where your narrator is interestingly unreliable, most of your, your narrator is going to be a bit of an open book to the readers. So if you want a character to stay enigmatic, you better not have them narrating the story. So for instance, in Room, I didn't switch back and forward between Jack and Ma, because I wanted Ma to be a sort of interesting mystery. She deliberately misleads Jack. She tries to give him the impression that she's just fine. So I didn't want to kind of spill the beans on the many ways in which she's not fine at all. Until, until the second half. Um, similarly, in The Wonder, Anne O'Donnell is my enigma. Um, I, I didn't want it to be simply, you know, is she, a, is she hoaxing them or not? I wanted it to be a, a, a deep examination of what's going on and why, and there not to be a one-line answer for that. So the best way to do that was to not have Anna be my point of view character. And of course, characters can all reveal themselves through dialogue, but not completely, and I, I, like, I like that. I like the fact that there's so much we don't know Whenever I'm watching a, a TV crime drama, um, I hate it when they suddenly jump from the detectives to, you know, in the serial killer's back room. And I'm thinking, you know, that, that's cheating. We've got this wonderful tension about where is the serial killer? And then the camera just hops there. Um, so I, I really like limited point of view. And I think whether you choose the child or the adult, there are wonderful consequences to not being in the head of the other people. Um, Actually, writing Room I found very easy using the child's voice because I had a five-year-old boy to hand. I, just, I was just a parasite on my son. I, I played with him in a way never before or since. Um, I paid a lot of attention. I wrote down just not, what, not just what he said, but how he said it. I analyzed his grammar like some anthropologist. Um, I, entire chunks of our conversations ended up in the book. I, 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 a few years after I'd published the book, I suddenly realized I was ending up more familiar with the sayings of Jack in the book than with my own son, because my own son would just live through it all once, whereas the book I was repeating. So I marked up a copy to, to record um, which bits were from my son, and there was some yellow highlighter on every page. So I would certainly recommend, if you want to write a book in the, in the voice of a child, have one to hand. I just wanted you to elaborate um, a little more on what you just said about Catholicism being a good religion for poor people? 
I wasn't suggesting that it's a bad one for rich people. I was saying specifically in, in terms of the kind of people I'm writing about in this book, I came to really appreciate why they clung to it, why in post-famine Ireland specifically, an intense form of piety built up where you'd not only go to mass every week and maybe confession every week, but you might also be in, say, the sodality of the Virgin Mary. Um, there would be regular uh, get-togethers like novenas. There'd be the Angelus twice a day. There'd be the rosary. I, I, I came to see why um, these people would have been particularly fervent in clinging to their faith because they'd been so, so battered, basically. Um, so the whole system began to make a lot of sense to me as I studied it. Um, but, you know, I'm talking very specifically about that cultural moment. And, of course, there are many flavors of Catholicism. The one I focused on in this book is that particularly ascetic, puritanical, you know, down with the body flavor of Catholicism. It's not like every Catholic actually talks that way. Um, so I think within any religious, uh, within any religious um, faith, you can, you can see a variety of flavors. They're always going to be the more fundamentalist ones and the more liberal and questioning ones. So it's a, it's a very uh, specific flavor of faith that I'm looking at in this book. And as I say, I think I could have set a story like this in a number of different settings, not even all religious ones. Um, you, could, you could set it in 1960s communism. You could set it in a cult nowadays. In, in any community where the rules are so extreme that a child might decide that the best way to impress everybody was to, to follow the rules in such an absolute way that they would lead towards starving to death. Uh, in the introduction, they mentioned that um, you have also written short stories. Do you still write short stories? And what do you find about writing a novel versus a short story? That's a question I'm a little embarrassed by because I haven't written short stories for a few years now. Um, I used to write them a lot. Um, I suspect it's because there's only a certain number of hours in the day, and in the last few years, I have moved into two new forms. One of them is screenwriting, so I'm currently committed to, I'm writing a film script of my last novel, um, Frog Music, and I'm also writing two other people's uh, adaptations. I'm adapting somebody's memoir and somebody's novel. Um, and I'm also writing fiction for children for the first time, and um, that's downright scary. Um, <laughs> Because I'm, I, you know, I, I see my own nine-year-old and my own twelve-year-old, and how, you know, unpersuadable they are if I think they should read a certain book and they've no interest in it. Um, so child readers are not polite. So I'm a little bit nervous of them en masse. Um, but because I'm taking up these new forms, I think I've had to, you know, give less of my energy to some others. And um, also, I always wrote short stories in the context of books of short stories. I'm very interested in the short story collection as a form. And so I used to put a lot of thought into collecting the right stories that would fill out this collection. And I don't happen to have one at the moment. So I'm sure I'll go back to short stories at some point, but I rather miss them because they are a wonderfully satisfying form for writers in particular because, you know, you can get them done in maybe, a, you know, it could be a week or it could be a few months, but they are self-contained. Um, novels can seem so baggy and arduous, you know, because you're involved in them for several years and... Sometimes it seems like every day you go back and fiddle with a bit, but it never feels quite finished. And by the time you finish that draft, you know, in theory you should polish it again, but you're just sick of it at that point, so you send it off. Whereas short stories, they're kind of small enough to fit in the hand. Um, so they are a wonderful form. Short stories also allow you to try things that you wouldn't commit yourself to for the length of a whole book. So, you know, I once did a short story about somebody who by the end of the story you realize is, is technically undead or a vampire and that she's been alive for centuries. Again, I wouldn't have written an entire vampire novel, but you can let yourself have little experiments if they don't take too long. So for so many reasons, I love short stories and your question reminds me, I really must get back to them one of these days. Hello, it's <laughs> been a pleasure to listen to you so far. Um, were you on the set when they filmed Room? I know some screenwriters stay on the set and change things and whatever. I just wonder what your experience with that was. I couldn't be on the set all the time because I had so many other things to write, including this novel. But I remember writing this novel on the, uh, on the train going up to Toronto where it was being filmed. I live two hours away. Um, so I went about once a week and I tried to sample each of the locations. And one of the funny things about how we filmed Room is that we did it more or less in order from the beginning of the story to the end, which is a weird way to make a film. 
Um, our director said he wanted to do this for the sake of the child because our lead actor, Jake Tromblay, was only seven and, and Lenny thought that filming the film chronologically would make a lot more sense to the child. He said afterwards that really he just wanted to do it chronologically. Um, uh, but, you know, it sounded better to persuade the producers that it was better to spend the money this way. But we all enjoyed it moving chronologically. It felt as if we were, you know, emerging from, from that smaller world into the bigger world. And um, so I'd go up and sample each of the locations. But I, I tried not to say a word on set because every minute is costing some huge amount of time. So if you delay the director even a minute, if you so much as get chatting to him outside the toilets, you know, the money clock is ticking. Um, so I figured if I hadn't put an insight into the novel or into the script, it was too late at that point. Um, so when I watch the film now, I can only see one thing that I actually altered on the day. Um, it was the scene where they finally go back to say farewell to the room, and Jack goes around the room touching everything. And I remember whispering in the director's ear, as it was my very last day on set, you know, I thought I could get away with it. I said, I think he'd open the wardrobe and look inside, you know. So, so he, he had Jake do that. So when I watch the film now, I'm like, oh, I made that moment happen. <laughs> But mostly I think I was warmly welcomed on set because I didn't attempt to uh, do last minute insights. And if, they w if, if the director wants you to make changes, you can always do that by email. You don't really have to be there. In fact, a lot of things were shared with me digitally. Like I wasn't there at the auditions, but they, they, put, uh, they put the audition tapes on private web links so I could look at them. Um, so, so in many ways I was, I was I was involved more, I was kept in the loop on many more matters than I thought I would be. It was great. Have your children seen the movie and what do they know about the book and the movie? They know the basics of the story. It's, it's like a fairy tale. It's quite easy to explain to a child, you know, a bad guy has you and your mother locked up in a house and you want to get away. You know, it sounds like Hansel and Gretel or something, doesn't it? Um, they have seen the film in, in a... In a in an altered form, meaning I got a web link and I showed it to them, but I kept pressing pause and then I would tell them what happens in the next scene and they would choose whether or not to watch it. And it's funny, they didn't mind watching things like the escape scene, you know, but they didn't want to see Ma arguing with her own mother. They thought grown-up arguments were really distressing. <laughs> so it's funny, they're not necessarily afraid of what we think they'll be afraid of. Um, but yes, they, they know all about it and they take pride. My son in particular takes pride in the fact that he inspired it. And um, the scene where Jack is rolled up in the rug, my son knows that he tried out the rug for me. I, I had drafted that scene and it was a bit too quick and easy, you know. Jack wiggles, the rug falls off. So I asked my five-year-old son, could I roll him up in the rug and would he try and get out? And I think I may have bribed him with a chocolate bar. I mean, he, he did not go unrewarded. Um, but anyway, it turns out it's incredibly difficult to get out of a rug. Um, there's a lot of friction in there. So I had to re-roll him, you know, against his protests, arrange his limbs differently. I had to do a lot of uh, working on, this, on that with him. And then afterwards, I completely rewrote the scene. So my son is immensely proud now that he was the original boy in the rug. I thought that room was an amazing story. Um, and coincidentally, I read it when I was on vacation. So... I was reading it and sharing it. I would read at night and then in the morning, all of my people that I was with wanted to know what was happening in the room, which was really kind of amazing to share. Um, my question is, do you think you would consider telling us what happens to Jack later in his life? I will never, never write a sequel, even though I'm asked to about once a week. So I, I, I assure you, I don't have some complete storyline that I'm withholding from my fans. Um, my best hope for Man Jack, you see, is that they will get to kind of fade into anonymity and relatively normal life, you know? I think I would speculate that Ma will always be shaped by what she went through, but, you know, there are so many examples of kids having got through a lot worse than Jack when it happened in their first few years. So I, I, I think given the amazing resilience, especially of a child who's been raised right, um, I imagine that Jack would be just grand and so there's no, sto there's no more story to tell. I think if I had to write a sequel about them, it would be because they were still so damaged. So I actually like the idea that they've sort of escaped the confines of my story and they get to, they get to be nameless out there. That's what I imagine. It's all speculation, of course. Talk a little bit about um, Canada, your experience there, the literary tradition there, um, just uh, your the, um, being an immigrant and a writer there. I think um, 
immigration and motherhood are probably the two best things that ever happened to me in terms of my writing. I mean, they've been good for my life too, but <laughs> just keeping my writer hat on. I think emigrating from Ireland really woke me up. And of course, some people managed to stay in their particular village and write amazing universal books. An Irish writer like John McGahern is known for being rooted in one place and finding the universal there. But I think I needed to be stimulated by the cultural differences of moving to England and then to Canada. Now, I was not moving to Bangladesh. You know, these were not massive jumps, so I'm not wanting to exaggerate it, but even the subtle cultural differences between those English-speaking countries. Or um, in, the last, in the last while, we've quite often gone and spent time in France because my partner is French. And again, it's those subtle differences that make you feel you know, like you're, you're splashed awake or like you have to be on your toes all the time or you'll get things wrong. Um, so um, yeah, Canada I moved to for love. It was nothing to do with my writing career, but I would say it's been a very good place to end up. Um, partly because in Canada, they take their writers very seriously. They treasure them. They, they fund their arts pretty well. Even uh, very small presses will tend to have exquisite um, design work and covers. Um, so I think a certain amount of cultural protectionism there has some very good effects for, for Canadian literature. And the Canadian literary tradition, unlike the Irish one, is not quite so famously male-dominated. You know, in Ireland, women writers tend to feel like we've come rather late to the party. Whereas in Canada, you know, women writers have been big names from the start, and you've got people like Margaret Atwood and Alice Munro kind of towering over the scene. Um, another thing I like is that in Canada, they accept their immigrants very fast, at least when they're writers. Um, so I, I had barely landed 18 years ago when a bookseller said to me, can I put Canadian author stickers on your book? I couldn't believe it. You know, I, I mean, I didn't yet have citizenship or anything, but clearly in the book world, they were more than happy to take all comers. Um, and I thought you'd be in Ireland two generations before anybody would put an Irish author sticker on you, you know? So I love that. I love the fact that the big names in Canadian literature are often immigrants. They're people like Brandon Mystery, um, Michael Ondaatje. Uh, so I like the diversity of the Canadian literary scene. I love the fact that, you know, writing about a lesbian subject matter doesn't make you marginal. I mean, my, my, whenever I do publicity in Ireland, uh, with any of my books that have uh, any queer subject matter, you know, the questions are just relentlessly about being a teenage lesbian in Dublin. Um, and then in Canada, they'll ask me about my use of the past tense or something literary, you know? <laughs> They're just so completely unfazed by that in Canada. So I feel as if Canada has allowed me to really move on with my life uh, rather than staying as a kind of oppressed minority. Um, so I think it's really contributed to my confidence and the egotism that this mic picked up earlier. <laughs> So having written a book that was made into a movie, now when you're writing other books, are you thinking about them as a movie? Not always. You... Um, I think The Wonder happens to have a very um, meaty storyline and, uh, yeah, it's quite sort of high concept, as they say in the industry. Um, and it's got a very vivid landscape. So I can see this one working as a film, yes, and I would love to write it. However, I don't ask that of all my novels. Um, it would be a shame to let one of my genres leak into the others, you know, because I write plays and novels, but I don't say to myself, could this work on stage? So similarly, I don't see film as kind of the ultimate heavenly goal for every piece of fiction. I think fiction is terribly good at the psychological, so I would be perfectly happy to write a novel which was very psychological and that you couldn't possibly film. Um, so I would say some of mine have film prospects and some don't. Um, but even the ones that have film prospects, I. You know, when I write them as books first, it's because it's in a book that I can work out all the little nitty gritties of the psychology. Um, so, so while I'm writing the novel, I try not to think at all about a possible film. Otherwise, you end up writing like Dan Brown, you know. <laughs> Heaven forfend. <laughs> Thank you all so much. <laughs>